Hi guys, um, Isaac, uh, doing one of the A2 masterclasses. Um, yeah, so I'll be doing, um, this one this week. This is Monday's paper. I'm not sure what's happening the, uh, with the others. Um, and I'm sure someone will put them up uh, soon. Um, let's just get the paper up and then start running through it. So it's one of the A2 papers, so slightly harder than the ones we were looking at last week. So question one, we have a firm increasing its product, its production. And when will this result in efficiency? Well, the answer that we, we clearly know is, is going to be A. Um, the reason for this is, is well, what we're looking for here is, um, kind of what do we mean by efficiency? Well, we're going to look at our two main notions of efficiency. That is productive efficiency and kind of allocative efficiency. And when you look through kind of the options, it's very clear that when you have a cost of producing kind of this marginal unit, um, the, the, the kind of last unit is equal to the value of the, uh, the consumer's place on it, then you're going to have some sort of efficiency. So if you produced any more units, the customer's kind of valuation of it wouldn't match cost. The firm would be losing money. But if you produced any more, you'd have opportunities for the firm to be making money. So, and so efficiency here, every you, every user, but productive efficiency, the firm is producing as much as it can, uh, financially viably at least. But we're also at allocative efficiency where each, um, kind of individual firm, um, that is the, uh, sorry, not each individual firm, each individual consumer is getting the good the, when they value it such that the firm can produce it. So we're kind of looking for that almost equilibrium notion there playing into efficiency. Look at question two. So we've got these two people, Joshua and Ruth, who are on this remote island, and there's kind of two two goods. They can have Joshua can have some goods, and Ruth can have some. It doesn't really matter what they are. And you can clearly see X, Y is kind of what we'd normally describe as the budget constraint. And um, it's showing as as we see it, it says it shows that the maximum amount of goods that are available to Joshua and Ruth, and the line from here to OE represents kind of an equal distribution. So at every point here, they have half the goods each. Um, or they have equal amounts of the goods, sorry, not this too So we're going to start at I, is what it's saying, so this initial point. And what would result in an increase in economic welfare according to the efficiency criteria? Well, what we know about, what do we know about efficiency? Well, we know that efficiency occurs when you make, you can't, there's a position where you can't make anyone um, better off than, you sorry, you can't make anyone better off without making anyone else worse off. But here we're not looking for Pareto efficiency. We're just trying to look for an increase in welfare. So what is an increase in welfare under Pareto criterion? Well, it's a situation where you can make someone better off and you're not actually making anyone else worse off. It doesn't have to be to a Pareto efficient point. It just has to be a more Pareto efficient point. So we can clearly see here. So is when we're at I, what we're looking for is an improvement in basically probably either Joshua or Ruth's situation. But an improvement such that it doesn't make anyone else worse off. So let's look at A. So A is that improvement for anyone? Well, Ruth has less goods. Uh, Joshua kind of has the same amount of goods, but because Ruth has kind of lost her amount of goods, we'd say that that's probably not a, an increase in, in it's not an increase in in economic welfare under Pareto criterion. What about B? Well, B is on the max line. Moving to B is though you're going to massively increase Joshua's goods, you're going to massively also decrease um, Ruth's goods, moving her from this kind of allocation here to having this many goods here level with point B. And it's the same with D. Whilst D would increase Joshua's goods again, you can see clearly that there's a reduction if you move in Ruth's goods, if you move from here at point I to kind of here at point B. So what's C? Well, C, we can see that Ruth's goods amount stays the same, but you've got an increase for Joshua. So we've made Joshua better off in terms of number of goods. Without really making Ruth any worse off, she still has the same. But that is a Pareto improvement. Okay, looking at question three. What do we consider to be the key difference between the use of cost benefit analysis in public sector investment projects compared with its use of private sector investment projects? So basically what it's asking is, is, is what the key difference is. So what, what, what is the, is, is a problem with this? Well, in Public sector projects, we don't actually have prices, right? Public sector projects are just kind of produced. There's no price indicating kind of costs and benefits to individuals. So it makes estimating benefits more uncertain. 
And that's basically the key difference. Um, it's important to kind of understand the, the differences between cost benefit analysis and public sector investment. And kind of what you're going to look at is what's the biggest difference between private sector and public sector investment. And the biggest difference is this absence of prices. There. Yeah. Question four. Why does a normal demand curve for a product slope downwards from left to right? So this is kind of asking why we see a downward sloping demand curve. And the reason is, excuse me, the reason is, is because of something called diminishing marginal returns. So what it basically means is if I have, let me explain diminishing marginal returns in an easy way. Imagine that I have a Mars bar and I value that Mars bar at 50 units of utility. I get 50 units of satisfaction from that. That gives me another Mars bar. Am I likely to still value that Mars bar as highly? Well, probably I might get 50 units of utility from it. Or I'm, I might I get 50 satisfaction points. That gives me a third Mars bar. Uh, maybe by this point I'm getting a bit sick of Mars bars. I don't really care as much. I don't value this one as highly. Now think about giving me an, a hun- the hundredth Mars bar, right? If you give me a, the hundredth Mars bar, I don't really need another Mars bar after the 99th at all. So I'm not really going to value it that much. So how do we kind of understand this in affecting demand is that people's demand, as they consume more of the product, they're prepared to pay less and less for it. So buyer's additional satisfaction does decline as consumption rises because of diminishing marginal returns. And it's that that causes the downward slope left and right. Question five. Here we have a diagram showing budget lines of a consumer who is choosing between two goods, X and Y. Initially, the budget line is MM. So here, that's our initial budget line. And we have the consumer at this position, A. Subsequently, we can see that the money prices of both goods change. So we can see that the price is actually essentially from X goes down from M to N, and the price for good Y goes up, or the, 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 the prices change. Which point is represented as the preferred position to, of the consumer after the change in prices if their tastes remain unchanged? So we're looking, where do we move from point A, given that prices have now shifted? So what's happened? Well, they're now able to consume more of, of um, point, uh, more of uh, good y and less of good x for the same price so we're assuming that their price because the price which is they're, they're going to have to shift somewhere it's not going to stay at a but what do we know well they're going to stay on n they're going to move to nn they're not going to be on mm anymore and they're going to shift in such a way such that they're going to demand more of good y and less of good x because the opportunity costs have question six a single firm in industry alters production but its actions have no effect on the market price of the good. If the price always clears the market, how does an economist classify this industry? Well, if you have a single firm altering its production, but it has no effect on the market price, then that's obviously perfect competition. Individual firms are price takers in perfect competition. They have no effect on the prices. Um, but we consider that to be perfect competition. That's kind of a simple definition of question there. Question seven. What is most likely to result in, in non-cooperative behavior between producers in an oligopoly market, well, is it going to be barriers to entry to firms? So we're looking at what creates this kind of like non-cooperative behavior, so them, them kind of fighting or them not working together on this. And what really makes it people not be able to cooperate is this kind of idea, well, one of them is going to be product differentiation, right? So if goods are they're selling similar products, but they're slightly different, they can't really cooperate on pricing because essentially the demand for each of their goods is slightly different. So when you start to introduce different product differentiation, you start to have different demands. And as such, the firms can't work as well together, especially in the monopoly. Um, ease of detection of prices, barriers of entry to firms, and stability in demand and cost of production over time are all likely to be reasons why firm producers in oligopoly markets do cooperate. And in this case, C is the only one that doesn't. So you could also solve this problem, answer this question, sorry, by uh, elimination. Question eight. When would the aim of a firm be most likely to be other than profit maximization? So we're talking here about different um, different aims of firms. We know that firms sometimes are profit maximizing, sometimes they're profit, their sales maximizing, maybe they're revenue maximizing. Maybe they have other objectives for various different reasons. So when are they not going to be profit maximizing? 
So when there's a large number of firms in the industry, we'd imagine them to probably profit maximizing. When there's a large number of shareholders and few paid managers, what are we likely to see? Well, the aim, what's the aim of the firm? Well, okay, this doesn't make sense. Um, let me check the Mark scheme for it. I've managed to shut down the Mark scheme. Um, let me have a look. Okay, actually, when the aim of the firm most likely to be other than profit maximum, I'm going to check this for you. I must have mishighlighted this answer. It's unlikely actually to be B in this case. A large number of shareholders and few paid managers means that they are actually likely to be profit maximizing. So I, th- I actually think the answer is A. So when there's a large number of firms in the industry, uh, you'll likely see perhaps some other non-profit maximizing uh, objectives because they're trying to get market share. They might be trying to for revenue maximize, sales maximize, gain market share. But that's likely to drive into the uh, firm profit maximization in those cases. Right. I'll check that for you at the end. The firm in monopolistic competition is maximizing profit and producing at the minimum point on its average total cost curve. What could not be correct? So we know that this is, firm is maximizing its profit. And it's also minimizing its average cost. So it's profit maximizing here. Very much so. What could not be the case? Well, in a monopolistic competitive market, the firm can't be making normal profit. It's making super normal profit. If it's profit maximizing and producing at the minimum point. That's just the nature of these, this kind of market situation is that the firm is not, is making normal profit can't be correct. It would be charging above, uh, its, its kind of cost covering situation and um, making super normal profit, given that it's in monopolistic competition. Question 10. What is competitive for price discrimination to be profitable? Well, if you're going to use price discrimination, you have to have, uh, what, well, let's just talk for a second, actually, what is price discrimination? So price discrimination is where you charge individuals different prices for the goods. Well, there's a few things you actually need for price discrimination. One of them is B, in this case. Um, markets with different price elasticity demand. There's no point, uh, you wouldn't make enough, as much money if individuals all, um, didn't have different price elasticity demand. That's the point. For example, young people might, you could say that, are oh, anyone between the age of 18 and 30 is likely to have in- more inelastic demand. Therefore, we can charge them a higher price. So, the whole basis of price discrimination is based on the elasticity of demand. But what else does it need? Well, it doesn't, some people might say, well, there needs to be separate markets. You need a separate market for individuals 18 to 30, and you need a separate market for individuals 30 to 50, et cetera. You need to be able to differentiate. That's true. You do need to differentiate, but you don't need to differentiate products for C. You need to differentiate consumers, but you don't also need separate markets. You can have the same market. What you need to do is you need to have a means of arbitrarily assessing who fits into which category. So age is a good one. Because it's very easy to look at someone's ID, their driver's license, passport, for example, and know what age they are, and therefore place them in a certain consumer category. It's more difficult, for example, if you were saying anyone, um, you were trying to differentiate based on geographic location, because people might just drive between geographic locations in order to, uh, to, 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 to kind of buy a cheaper product. Sometimes geographic location does work, or they do price discriminate based on geography. But for, it doesn't really, and that's because they perceive that individuals aren't going to be bothered to drive between um, different areas in order to buy products. For example, let's think about this. If you, where do you see price discrimination in uh, terms of classifications? Well, for those of you that haven't been to London, you'll know that stuff is in London. But it's not the fact that a car, for example, is more expensive than London. If a car was more expensive in London and then was cheaper 100 miles from London, Significantly, you might get people driving 100 miles from London to the other place to buy the car and then driving it back to London. Things like coffee, things like food, things like dinners, meals out, etc., are more expensive in London, principally because they're, um, principally because they're things that people won't be able to buy. And that's called, um, it's called, uh, now that name is about my kids. Uh, the name for it is arbitrage. Sorry. So arbitrage is where you go somewhere else to buy something cheap and then take it back to the place where it was more expensive. Often arbitrage refers to also then selling it there for a profit, but you could just use it, I guess. Anyway, enough on price discrimination. Question 11. 
Firmly, the downward sloping straight line demand curve for its product is producing at an output where its marginal revenue is positive. Which strategy would be most effective? The owners of the firm want to maximize the total revenue of the firm. So we're looking for a kind of an effective strategy to maximize total revenue. So how do we uh, revenue maximize? Well, we try and sell every unit uh, where we get a positive revenue from. And what does that mean? Well, it means marginal revenue is equal to or above zero. Any point where marginal revenue is above zero, that is the revenue of selling the next product is above zero, is contributing to overall revenue. Once you go past the point where marginal revenue is zero, you're no longer making positive revenue. You're then making negative revenue. In a sense, you'd have to pay people to buy it to take your product. But at that point, you're clearly detracting from your total revenue. So you're basically going to produce at every point up to where your marginal revenue is zero. Hence the answer C. Question 12. Question 12 here shows the diagram um, of a firm short run and long run average cost curves. And we need to well, simply differentiate between long run average cost curve and short run average cost curve. So how would we do this? Well, what we know is that an average cost curve is less, is more kind of like bowed, right? Is more flat in the long run than a short run average cost curve. Um, so the short run average cost curve here would be KLM and the long run average cost curve would be JLM. That's just about understanding your, the nature of the different curves. And I don't want to find the diagram. Those should be easy questions for you to get the marks on. Question 13. Here, question 13 is showing us the, the employment size distribution of manufacturing firms in two European countries reported by the OECD, which is the Organization for Economically of, 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 of sorry, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. And this is in 2011. So what are we looking at? So it's basically like looking at firms in terms of how many employees they have. And we have country X. For example, 19% of firms um, has 250. Um, these firms have, they've got 30 different firms. But we can see what the biggest difference is. Well, the biggest difference is clearly that country X has a lot more smaller firms, whereas country Y has a lot more big firms, for example. They're kind of similar in this kind of mid-sized range, but they really differ here. Almost half the firms in country Y are bigger than 250 employees, and half the firms in country X are smaller than 50. So why would we see that? Well, let's think, what creates small firms? We're trying to find a reason why Country X has a lot of little firms. And if it had a larger supply of entrepreneurs who generally work in small startup companies, then they're likely to have less in uh, kind of smaller uh, firms in general. So that's one. That's probably the most likely explanation for that of the ones here. Right. So now we have a firm in question 14. A firm is facing a downward sloping demand for its product. So normal demand. Assuming that labor is the only variable factor input, so it's the only thing the firm can change, how does the firm derive its demand curve for labor? Well, what's it going to think about? So labor is the only thing it kind of has to spend money on. So how is it going to determine its price? Well, it's not going to use current price of output and the money wage rate of labor. It doesn't do that. That's not going to give you an accurate kind of covering of your costs. You're not going to use the marginal factor cost of labor because it's not about cost of labor. Remember, it's about how much you really want. It. You, you would happily employ or pay the cost of labor if it produced enough. But what we're really considering here is the schedules of the marginal physical product of labor, and that means how much extra product the labor producing, each unit of labor producing, and then how much revenue is that sold for. And if you're able to get more revenue than you are, uh, you were able to get revenue for your product, at that point, you're going to employ people. So that's how it's going to derive how much labor it wants, is based on how much it's produced, how much labor this labor could produce, and how much money it can get for the production, for the things that the labor produces, if that makes sense. Question 15. In the diagram, we have um, these these different curves. Here we have a uh, AR, the ARPL curve is average revenue product of labor curve, but it's profit maximizing monopsony. So it's a monopsony here, that's going to be important. A monopsony is a firm which is kind of a single buyer um, in a market. And then we have its marginal revenue product of labor curve as well. So we've got its average and marginal. It's paying them a wage here at W, which is set by this kind of minimum wage. And these other curves are the average and marginal factor cost curve. So how much would the cost be in the absence of government intervention? So what will happen to the number of workers employed by the firm if the minimum wage is abolished? So what's the, um, 
what's the what's the current situation at the minimum wage? Well, currently um, they are employing how many workers? So they're going to be employing where uh, at, at, at kind of this point here. So O to K is the amount that they're going to be um, employing at that point because they w- they're going to kind of em- be employ at the point here, at this point here, where the MRP is level to the wage, marginal, uh, um, re- the, the, sorry, the marginal uh, revenue product of labor. I'm just trying to work out what they've labeled it as, where MRP is equal to the wage. However, now we've got free market. What are they going to do? Well, they're going to charge clearly where MRP equals MFC, where the marginal revenue, um, m- marginal revenue product of labor is equal to this av- uh, marginal factor cost of labor. And that's going to be up here. So the wage is going to be a little bit higher. Um, and they're going to be employed. Um, they're going to employ there. So we've, we're kind of abolishing the minimum wage and we're now we're paying higher and we're employing there. So how many workers are going to be lost? Well, they're going to clearly very evidently reduce their, uh, number of workers from K, uh, K, OK to OJ. So the loss of workers here is going to be, um, J, K. So the kind of that area there. So when you find that, that gap is the kind of the increase in unemployment, the, the loss of number of workers there. Question 16. What could raise the level of employment in an industry producing good acts? So we're trying to work out a way that an industry can increase, kind of will employ more people. So what what would do that? Well, clearly here we're looking for something that either cheapen makes labor cheaper, makes them more profitable or productive, or which makes the good they're producing more productive. So which they're producing good X. So what makes good X? So let's look at A. Well, A is decline the marginal physical productivity of workers means you're going to employ less. Obviously, if workers are becoming less productive, you're not going to want as many of them. They're useless or less useful. B, if you impose a tariff on an imported good, which is a complement, that's going to decrease demand. You're not going to be able to sell as many of your goods. That's not going to increase employment there. Remember, this is a that we're importing, and they've imposed a tariff, which raises the price of complement. So demand for your goods is going to go down. Question C, an introdu- uh, answer C, sorry, the introduction of an employer's contribution to a welfare scheme for each, each employee. So that just makes, basically is saying that each employer, so the companies would have to pay more to the state so that each employee then gets some welfare, like some benefits. So it costs the firm more to hire each employee. The cost of labor has gone up. That's not going to make them employ more people. What about the removal of a sales tax on the good? Well, that's going to make sure all the, reduce the price of the good in terms of they don't have to pay a tax now, but they could probably charge the same rate and the firm's going to get more profit. So essentially the good has just become more profitable. If the good becomes more profitable and we've removed this by removing the sales tax, then they're going to want to produce more of it. They're going to need to increase their labor in that case. Which combination of fiscal policy measures is question 17 is asking would be most effective in reducing income inequality. So we're trying to do something that's going to lessen the gap between rich, the richest and the poorest. So if we increase the top rate of income tax, yes, we're taking more people away from the rich. That's going to more money away from the rich. That's going to help. Reducing indirect taxes would also help because reducing indirect taxes is um, indirect taxes are aggressive. We don't like indirect taxes. Uh, so reducing them is going to kind of reduce the burden on the poor. And if we're increasing the value of state benefits, that means we're giving more money to the poor. So obviously we want to increase and then increase um, the value of state benefits and increase the top rate of income tax. It's basic redistribution. The difference between A and B then is going to be on what we do with indirect taxes. The indirect taxes are taxes um on a good, a ra- like n- not a, um, a kind of percentage tax, a proportional tax. They're a set amount, uh, a fixed rate tax, a kind of fixed amount tax, maybe like 50p or a pound or whatever. And those affect um, poor people more than they affect the wealthier in society. So reducing those is going to kind of help reduce income inequality there. The diagram here shows an industry supply and demand curve. Very easy. So the government here is restricting the quantity to OQ. The pre or equilibrium quantity is here. Now we're having the government says we're going to have to produce here. The quantity has then been removed. So we're going to move probably to our equilibrium here. Given that there are no externalities, what's the net game in economic welfare? Well, we were producing there. Now we're producing there. This is the increase in consumer surplus, uh, producer surplus. 
That's now the de- increasing consumer surplus. We've now moved to there. So rather than being at OQ, we're now at O quantity, kind of this whole space there, as it were. And by moving there, we're gaining this area of welfare, evidently. B plus W. It's quite a simple diagrammatic question. And question 19 is a nice definitional question, asking us what is not included in the measure of national income. And this is simply you know what doesn't factor from this, and it's benefits paid to unemployed. That's not in the measure. Question 20. The graphs show here the percentage changes in money GDP and consumer prices in a country between 2013 and 2015. The change in money GDP. So GDP went up in money terms and then down. While we see this kind of steady increase in inflation, though it started a lot quicker and then kind of petered out and then again accelerated. So what do we conclude? Well, the percentage change, we can see that overall, although they've slowed down, there's still an overall percentage change and increase in both. Both have remained positive, which means they're continually increasing. So the only thing we can actually conclude is that consumer prices and money GDP both continue to rise. The thing that's going to catch a lot of people out is this kind of GDP in going down here. But remember, it's not GDP decreasing. It's the rate of change in GDP. So at this point, GDP was increasing by about 11 percent. But here, GDP is only increasing by 5 percent. So it's not that GDP has gone down. It's just that it's increasing at a slower rate. Question 21. Which of the following are characteristics of most developing countries? Well, here it's just asking if you well, think about what the poorest countries in the world are like. Well, they tend to have high levels of government jet to GDP. Uh, governments tend to need to borrow a lot of money to like finance things the infrastructure because they generally have a very good tax base. They don't tax their own populations, their population is quite poor. Government borrow lots of borrow lots of money for lots of different things. And they generally have quite a low average propensity to save. This is another crucial one. Because if you're very poor in this country, let's say you're a Ghanaian farmer, and suddenly someone gives you a hundred pounds, are you going to go and spend it on food for your family and essentials, or are you going to put it under the bed for a rainy day? You're probably likely to go and spend it on food for your family because you don't have much of that. So in poor developing countries, people save very much. Right, let's look at question 22. Question 22 asks us about the labour from developing countries, and it says that the labour often migrates to developed countries and finds jobs. You can see that in the UK or many other developed countries around the world. You can see a lot of uh, migrant communities from poorer countries or developing countries moving in to find better jobs. How would such movement labour be likely to affect economic growth? And the pressure on wages rises in the developed countries, so in the one where everyone's moving. What do we see? Well, we've got more people working in the country. That's obviously going to increase economic growth. What's it going to do in terms of wage rises? Well, it's going to decrease pressure on wage rises because there's a greater employment pool for people. There's more alternatives. If the firms, if the individuals demand higher wages, well, then the migrant communities can come in and say, well, we'll work for less. And that's generally what we're seeing. So people who accuse a slightly political point there, people who would tend to say, well, all the immigrants are causing us so many problems. Well, it's not that they're not contributing to economic growth. Migration does contribute to economic growth. It's that we're not seeing wages rising, so individuals feel slightly poorer. And that's a big issue with terms of like in, in national populations having issues with immigrants is over this kind of wage rising issue. This is a de- question 23 is a definitional question about unemployment. It's not particularly complicated. Thinking what is the deficiency in aggregate demand? It's not structural unemployment, it's cyclical unemployment. Let's just go through the different types. Cyclical unemployment goes with the trends in the economy. So if there's a recession, you get unemployment. If there's a boom, you get more employment. So we're talking about cyclical unemployment. Voluntary unemployment is where an individual just simply doesn't want to work for the wage they're offered. Structural unemployment is the, probably the next biggest one. Structural unemployment looks at where there's a, a kind of skills mismatch. So maybe the economy needs a lot more computer engineers but we don't have enough computer engineers. So there's clearly structure, there's jobs out there, but it's that the people who have the, who need the jobs don't match the jobs that are needing to be done, and therefore you have unemployment. That's structure. Question 24. The diagram we have showing an annual percentage change in employment and output in the UK, private sector between 2000 and 2012. There we go. We've got a massive drip, dip around the recession as output and impl- uh, unemployment. Well. In which year did labour productivity decrease the most? But what we're seeing, what we're looking for here is a series when you've got a massive increase in employment and kind of a fall or a stagnation in output. So you get more people working, but not much more being produced. So clearly here in 2012 is when you get this big segment of labour productivity increase because you've got a lot more people working, but yet you're producing less. 
Question 25. What is most likely to cause a decrease in the public's ratio of cash to bank deposits? Well, the ratio is basically how much do people have in their cash outside and how much they have in the bank. That's the ratio. So if you have a more, basically what's likely to cause a decrease in that ratio, so there's basically less cash in the bank, it, there's less bank deposits, is if you increase the number of cash dispenser machines and ATMs, more people are going to be taking money out. There's going to be less in the bank. You reduce the interest rates on bank deposits. There is going to be uh, an increase in the ratio. People are going to take, take their money out, etc., etc. In an economy with no government sector, so we've got no, invest, no government investing, we've just got consumption, investment, exports and imports. We can see that we've got this here. What will be the equilibrium level of Y? This is just a mathematical equation here. So what we're going to look for is we're going to try and we know that national income, which is Y, must equal C plus I plus G plus X minus M. So we know that Y equals 20 plus, you can just set the equation out, 20, Y equals um, 20 plus um, 0.75 Y um, plus 60 plus um, 120 minus uh, plus 120 minus 120. So we can say that that's simply just zero. So we would say that 20 plus 0.75y equals 60. So we need uh, those to be equal there. So we know that the equilibrium national level of national income is going to be 320. And we can work that out from just kind of doing the maths of the equation. Because we know that y is equal to c plus i plus x minus m in this situation. Do, do, do. One way to solve this, let me just say quickly, if you're struggling to just formulate the equation, is to simply say that, well, we know that um, 100 and we, we know that um, uh, at this point, y has to, well, we can just simply kind of put the put the maths in, right? So we'd say 320 equals 20 plus 0.75 of 320 plus 60 plus uh, plus 60. Um, so we're just kind of looking for the math to work. You can just kind of input these numbers into there, into the Y at this end and the Y in here and see which one works. And the answer is going to be. I can quickly run through that in my head. So Y is equal to 320 and that has to equal C, which is 20 plus 0 0.75. 0 0.75 of 320 is 20, 240. Yep. Yeah. So 240 plus 60 is 300. Plus the 20 there is equal to 320. So we can clearly see that C is the answer. It's just simple maths on the equation. Which kind of correctly identifies question 27? Sorry, which co correctly identifies leakages from a country's circular flow of income? So what we're looking for here is what's going to identify the leakages. Well, is the private sector say if, if savings are greater than investment? Well, that is going to be a leakage. We're not going to see as much investment. People are putting money in the bank and not investing. The public sector, if taxes are greater than government spending, that is a leakage. We're taking money out of people's pockets, but not spending it in government. In the trade sector, if exports are greater than imports, well, that's not a leakage because obviously that's both on the flow of, in on the flow of income. That's no, so we're looking at yes, yes, no. Question 28. The table gives an economy's unemployment rate and inflation rate for a five year period. So here we've got our unemployment rate. We can see kind of fell between 2010 and 2012 as the economy recovered and then kind of stayed the same from 2012 to 2014. Inflation kind of went down a little bit, came back and has kind of been the same in 2013 to 2014. So what changed between consecutive years was an agreement with the Phillips curve analysis. Well, what does our Phillips curve analysis say? Well, it says that as unemployment falls, um, inflation rate goes up, that they move in opposite directions, and that there's a trade-off between unemployment and inflation. You can't have rising unemployment and rising inflation, and you can't have falling unemployment and falling inflation. So we're looking for them moving in opposite directions, and it's clear that only between kind of what's been 2011 and 2012, we can see that unemployment fell by 0.6.2 to 5.8%, yet at the same time, inflation rate went up by 0.2%. But because they're moving in opposite directions, that fits with the Phillips curve analysis. Question 29. Workers in poor countries are often less productive than workers using the same technology in rich countries. That's true. You give them the same technology. Workers in poor countries aren't good at it. 
what would change that? Well, what's the reason for most of the time them being as productive is they don't have the education and training and skills workers of rich countries do. So how would you solve that? Well, increased investment in education in poor countries, C, is obviously quite a good solution, given that what we're looking for is to remedy this difference in skills that's causing individuals in poor countries to be less productive with the same technology. If the issue was technology, you'd obviously want to invest in giving the poor countries better technology. But here, the issue clearly doesn't seem to be the same technology. It seems to be the fact that the workers in poor countries are less good at using it. So therefore, we want to educate them more. Question 30, finally, what is most likely to increase as a result of a rise in interest rates in a country? Is the inflow of short-term foreign capital is the answer. The reason being, if you increase interest rates, people are going to suddenly put their money in, a, in the country because they're going to get a lot of returns. Uh, there's going to be a lot of inflow of this kind of foreign capital because the interest rate going up means that if you put your money in that country, you're going to get a better return on investment. So that's everything that you're going to flow in there. So we wanted to check question eight, which was the one I thought was wrong. So I'm just going to have a check on the mark scheme. Go on, sprint with the Trello board. Let's just have a quick look at that. Oh, this is Monday's paper, art scheme. We look for question eight. Have they remained at B? Let's have a look. They still say it's B. They say it is B. So this question doesn't make sense. This is actually, that's wrong in terms of economic analysis. And I'm wondering whether it's to do with the phrasing of the question. And when it asks, when would the aim of a firm be most likely to be other than profit maximization? So when that starts, when it's not profit, when it's going to be something that's not profit maximization, when you have a lot of shareholders and few paid managers, the aim of the firm is likely to be profit maximization. So I'm still going to maintain that my answer would be A, and I'm going to have a think and speak to a few of my friends who are also economics graduates, and ask why they think that might be wrong. Um, on that note, thanks so much for listening. Um, I hope that was a helpful masterclass. Um, I'm not sure who's doing the lesson this week. I think it's someone else. But if I do come back to you and I don't hear you before, have a very good Christmas and I'll speak to you in the new year.